today on the 700 Club Canada. Uh, the other thing is we need to pray. We mm -hmm. need to pray that God gives our leaders creative solutions to deal with this fiscal issue and to break the injustice off of future generations. What about writing our government representatives? Sure, do it. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Lori Hartzorn. And we are so excited that you've joined us today. You know, we're joined by special guest and friend Fatin Grzeski today for our In Focus segment. And Fatin is here to discuss key issues for the upcoming election and how they relate to us. You won't want to miss that a little later in the show. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, it's so important, isn't it, that we vote, that we use our voice come this election? Well, this is a critical time, Lori. You know, when we look at the debt, when we find, when we see the things that are going on right now in the nation, and we look at uh, some of the, the areas, and I'm talking about some very critical areas of uh, right to life and also, you know, looking at our First Nations and, and some of these other areas. And taxation. Taxation issues, yeah. and uh, really looking at uh, what we're going to uh, hand to the next generation. That's right, that's right. We need to make our voice heard. We this do. is going to be very critical for us. Yeah, so if you are free to vote, use your freedom. Mm -hmm. right? You'll also see a powerful story of one woman who didn't let her past get in the way of a promising future. But first, there is no looking back at a life of pain for Tiffany. This is how she found a future. Take a look. Divorce is a heartbreaking event for any family. For Tiffany Flock, it was the spark that led her into rebellion. I was a daddy's girl, and so when my dad had to leave the home, I was, I was just crushed. And then right after that, my mom started dating other men. I can remember seeing my mom hold another guy's hand. I went outside and just started screaming. It was, it was horrible. It was so horrible. By the age of 12, Tiffany began to hang out with much older friends. First, they enticed her to drink, then to use drugs. Finally, they dared her to have sex. Here I am, 12 years old, and it was a dare from my friend. And so I was like, okay, everyone else is doing it, so why not? And, and so that's, that's where it started. For the next several years, Tiffany partied to deal with her anger and insecurity over the divorce. By age 15, she was pregnant. And I was just like, oh gosh, I'm pregnant. And a lot of my friends were getting pregnant at that time. At that point, did you have plans to carry out the pregnancy? At first, to be rebellious towards my mom, that's how her and I were in a fight on the phone, and I was like, well, guess what? I'm pregnant. And she just flipped out. She was like, oh my gosh, you know, you're 15. What are we gonna do? Tiffany's parents took her to a clinic to have an abortion. It was afterwards um, that I ended up in the back seat of the car screaming at the top of my lungs because I just, I was in pain and it, it was, it was just traumatic and I, I didn't really understand what, what, I, what I had just went through and what I had just done. Two years later, Tiffany was pregnant again. I had been being promiscuous, sleeping with a few different guys. Tiffany didn't tell her parents. This time, she and her boyfriend went to the abortion clinic to end her pregnancy. I started having intense pain. I didn't know what was going on, but I couldn't even work because I was doubled over. It hurt so bad. And so we had to, my mom took me to the doctor, and when she took me to the doctor, we found out there was, um, there was fetal matter still in me. And so like baby's arms or legs or something was still inside of me. Tiffany's pregnancy had been too far along for the type of abortion that was performed. So she had to undergo surgery to complete the botched abortion. The scene played itself out a third time two years later. Tiffany, now 19, was still on drugs and headed for her third abortion. The other two times I had been asleep, they had put me to sleep for the procedure, but this time I was awake and I could remember hearing everything. It was, it was the worst, like that was the most traumatic experience in my whole life. I could just remember hearing this vacuum thing and all of a sudden I just felt, I just felt my insides being ripped out of me. And, and I started screaming. I was like, ah! And um, the doctor was like, be quiet. The, the other girls in the other room can hear you. Tiffany and her boyfriend eventually broke up, but she was back on the hunt for another man to fill her void. During those years, what is it that you were searching for? Love. Mm -hmm. 
love from anything that would give me love. If there was a guy that I, I thought the physical, let's have sex was showing me love where really it was ripping my heart out <laughs> and tearing my soul apart. When a friend invited Tiffany to his church's singles group, she took him up on the offer, even though she considered herself anything but a church kid. It was just a bunch of single, you know, 20-somethings, and they were just having a good time worshiping the Lord. And so I liked it, and I felt free. I felt free there. Tiffany decided to visit the Sunday service. That morning, a major change took place in her heart. I accepted Jesus right then, and I just started crying. It was like I finally was saved, but I knew that there was about to be a major, like, I have to follow the Lord. It was the most difficult season of my life because the longer I was sober, the longer I had to deal with who Tiffany was. Tiffany stopped partying, but had a hard time facing her past and the pain from her parents' divorce. I can remember being in the bed, just weeping like a little girl, like just balled up and had my grandmother on the phone. And she's like, Tiffany, whatever you do, do not give up. I just felt so lonely, but it forced me into reading the Bible. As Tiffany studied her Bible, she realized the gravity of her three abortions. A flood of emotions swept over her one Sunday in church. At that moment, I just broke. I was like, wow, I murdered three children. I mean, it was, it was like, it was like I just got hit in the head with a brick. I just lost it and just started asking the Lord to forgive me. But it was reality, what I, what I had done, that those three lives and their destinies would never come forth. I did struggle with guilt for a season of my life until the Lord set me free from that. And now, you know, it just pushes me into intercession for life, that, that people would, would choose life instead of death. Tiffany found someone to share her life with. She and her husband, Nathaniel, are expecting their first child. I have the most amazing husband ever. Before, it was just out of me wanting to fulfill a, a desire of needing to be wanted or loved. And now with, Na with Nathaniel, it's just a gift because I realized that Jesus loves me and Nathaniel's love is just a gift for me. It's not, I'm not seeking after him to love me. What are your hopes for your baby? That it would be everything that God plans it to be. I want the fullness of its destiny to come forth. Since I've become a Christian, I have found the love that I've always been searching for. There's just a peace about me knowing that the Lord loves me. His word is a lamp upon our feet and, and a light upon our path. And I feel that as I walk every day. Lori, one of the things that really gripped me with uh, Tiffany's story is be quiet because the other girls can hear you. Mm, I know. And you know, Brian, I met with a lot of women both young and old, who've experienced abortion and watching this story, I'm sure if that's you, you feel the shame and the pain that she felt. Yeah. And you know, when Tiffany gave her life to Christ, it she said it hit her like a brick, yeah. these abortions that she had. So I just want to say to you today, there is no shame at the foot of the cross. Amen. Jesus loves you. And he offers forgiveness. That's why he went to the cross. It doesn't matter. We're all sinners. It doesn't matter how we've chosen to go against God. He loves you. And he wants you to know that you can walk in forgiveness. But I, I know Tiffany needed to forgive herself first. Yeah. And that's part of God helps us forgive ourselves. Let me read a verse to you from 1 John 1, 7. It says, but if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship. We have a relationship, communion with, each, mm. with God and with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. It's a cleansing at the cross and it's an ongoing cleansing. He continues and will always forgive you. So if that's you today and you need freedom, you need to learn to forgive yourself, I want you to call us, one 855 700 We want to pray with you and agree with you that forgiveness is for you too. Let's do that right now. And you know, you can write in your home and uh, if you've gone through that, I just want you to just hold your hands like this, clasp them together and just say this, Jesus, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me for my poor choices. I confess my sin. Now, open those hands. Father, I pray that even as those hands open, you would start the work of release. 
according to your word in redemption. You said in 1 John, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I pray today, not only your forgiveness would flow, but they would now forgive themselves mm -hmm. in Jesus' in name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've done next, that, yeah. Yeah. one 800 Call us. I really believe God did a work today. Yeah, most important thing. So up next, some tips on what you should know for the elections as we're joined by Faye Teen Krzyzewski on In Focus. Welcome to In Focus. With this fall's federal election fast approaching, we wanted to take some time to educate you on some of the major issues that are currently being debated in our nation's capital. And we're joined today by television host and activist Fatine Grzeski, who looks at these issues through the Canadian Christian lens and has some insight into what they mean for us. Welcome back to In Focus, Fatine Grzeski, mm. my Always friend. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. You know, when we look at uh, this election, uh, many are saying this is going to be a, a watershed moment for Canada. I believe so. And, uh, you know, when, when we start uh, looking first at the political climate and what's taking place, kind of give us a, uh, a bird's eye view of what you're seeing right now and across party platforms and, and what's taking place. Well, there are so many issues, and I know yep. you're going to be highlighting different ones and shows to come uh, that are worthy of our focus and attention coming into this federal election, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, mm. so much. But I, the one of the ones that's really hijacked my attention is the federal debt. You know, uh, recently I, I interviewed Christine Van Gein from the Canadian Taxpayer Federation and learned that in Ontario, the marginal tax rate right now in Canada is as high as 53%. Uh. Let me break that down for you. What that means is when you include income tax, mm -hmm. tax at the till, gas tax, uh, and all the little hidden fees that kind of hit us throughout the year when you're renewing your driver's license, that type of yeah. thing, the average Canadian can be paying over 50% of their annual income mm. simply to the government. So even if you don't work for the government, yeah. you work for the government. <laughs> that, and that's money that's not going to food, it's not going to yeah. your future, it's not going to education, it's not going to retirement. And what I'm starting to see here is like, okay, we're spending spending $80 million a day right now just to service the interest on the federal debt. Yeah. Um, Brian, the last uh, budget cycle that we had, uh, we paid more to interest on the federal debt than the deficit. The interest on the federal debt was $24 billion. The deficit was about $19 billion. All of this money at the end of the line means means we can't uh, service our veterans yeah. in a way, our single moms. Social programs. Social programs, uh, First Nations kids with who don't have clean drinking water. Right. And so at the Housing. end of the line mm -hmm. on this fiscal imprudence, people are being hurt. And not only today, but future generations. So this is a huge issue, this issue of deficit, and I would say radical deficit spending. And, you know, I, I think we have to reframe uh, what it means as far as what the debt is currently. Because I think so many times, it's, it's just hard, it's staggering. Uh, some of the, uh, the figures are around 700 Billion. Mm -hmm. Put that in layman terms. Help okay. us. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what you owe on that seven hundred billion. How yeah. about that? Okay. It, it hits Be personal. Nice. Come okay. on. <laughs> you owe and I owe about eight over eighteen thousand um, of the federal debt. That's your portion. You owe. Yeah. So at some point in your lifetime, you know, hopefully in the near future, hopefully we'll be paying this down quicker yes. rather than than later. Um, you know, eighteen thousand has to come out of your pocket, out of mm -hmm. your your muscle time. Um, you add the provincial debt on top of that. It's another twenty two thousand. So your total debt portion. Federal and provincial is about forty thousand. If you live in Ontario, yes. uh, if you live in Alberta, it's about thirty thousand. If you live in Quebec, it's about forty-five thousand. Just for breathing. Yeah, just for breathing, just for being born, just for immigrating to Canada. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a household of four or five, you know, just multiply it, right? And so this is what this all boils down to: is more taxes. 
Yeah. At the end of the line, we are spending more of our life just working to pay taxes mm -hmm. than to build a future in a family. So many times people say, you know what, but this is a, a, a fear monger and you guys are, are really blowing these things out of proportion. But help us to understand what, uh, what what do economists say during a time of yeah. debt? What should we be focusing on? Well, first of all, I, I want to, like, I was shocked to learn that this is pretty new. This type of uh, national fiscal behavior really yeah. only began in the 70s, where we, where governments began to really, you know, aggressively spend and, and, and run deficits year yes. after year. When I was born, my portion of the federal debt was about $700. Mm -hmm. Now, as I just mentioned, it's about eighteen, maybe $19,000. And we just took a screenshot before you even came on, yeah, on the air. Yeah, yeah. about $19,000. Okay, so that's how quickly it's gone up in the yeah. last 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, before the 70s, we're literally walking off our map every Every day, mm -hmm. we are in a massive fiscal experiment, and that should cause concern, because and it needs to be a conversation. Because it is affecting our children. Yeah, a righteous man leaves an inheritance for their grandchildren. Yeah. Right now, we Finally. are not doing that in Canada. We're leaving a massive debt burden to our grandchildren, and but we can change it, now, Brian. We can change it. Let's turn it now another direction. What can we do, and and how could we begin to get involved? Well, okay. Voting um, our, our voice, letting our voice be heard. Sure, yeah, it needs to be an issue in the election. We need to uh -huh. elect governments provincially, municipally, and federally that are committed to balancing the budget and paying down the debt and maybe even bringing forward balanced budget legislation. Yes. Like, why is it legal, you yes. know, to spend our grandchildren's money this aggressively? I'm just putting some thoughts out there. Uh, the other thing is we need to pray. We mm -hmm. need to pray that God gives our leaders creative solutions to deal with this fiscal issue and to break the injustice off of future generations. What about writing our government representatives? Sure, do it. You know, when, when you look at this election, uh, how should we be looking at voting and getting out? Because I really want to call to action right now. What would you say to that, that person that says, I haven't voted in the past, but hmm. why is it important now to be involved? It is so important. It is so important. The governments that we elect today are building our tomorrow, right? Yes. And we have a stewardship. We have a responsibility uh, to the Lord, but also to future generations to steward this time well so that they are blessed and not burdened. Yeah. And that, the minimal, minimal thing to do is to vote. Well, so, but people can, they can check out formycanada.ca. There's other organizations out there that will help break it all down and make it easy so you know where to go. And simplify it and get involved. Yeah. Faithine Grzeski, my friend. Hey, it's good seeing you. Thanks for and having me. And great catching up with you. You know, we want you to get involved. And make sure, 700club.ca, that you uh, look at our website. We'll direct you into those areas where you could be informed. But we also want to uh, make sure that we pray, but we make our voice be heard. We'll be right back after this. The pediatric ER doctor, she says, we're losing her and I think she's, she's going to pass. I'm crying out to God, but my faith just vanished at that point. I didn't have any hope. I didn't see a way out. We need to take our authority in the Lord. And when we do, we get rid of fear. The I Wills of God, the latest teaching from Pat Robertson, available now. I'm Carla Matmati. I'm 24 years old, and you would never believe how much life I've lived in those 24 years. When I was 14, I was molested at school. It made me feel like I was nothing. It made me feel dirty. I was just hurting so badly. I didn't care what kind of friends I had, just as long as I was accepted. I really, really love music. I started playing the viola. I think I started singing later. I started playing professionally when I was 14. If I was first chair in the symphony or, or I did well in, in competitions, that I felt like I was something. That's really the only time that I felt special. I went away to college. I did pretty well at first, but I started partying. We had had a party in our apartment, and I ended up getting date raped. I honestly thought my life was over. Completely over. I didn't know how to walk through it. I didn't know how to just be a normal person. I was living in a nightmare. I would have done anything at that point to escape what I was feeling. I had started drinking a lot, really heavily. If anything I could get my hands on, I would do. I had tried drugs, marijuana, to cocaine. So at night, if I wasn't out at a party, I would just be up 
or I would pace. One night I was in the hallway just by myself. I just heard a voice say, I still want you. And every time I say that, I feel it all over again. Because I had a realization, an instant realization that Jesus and God, the God that created everything in the whole world, wanted me. He was telling me that he wanted me and that he had still wanted me. And so I had knelt down and I, I said to him, Jesus, I don't want to die anymore. I want to live. And I woke up the next morning and I was happy. I had never been, I had never felt happiness like that before in my life. I was changed and then it was because of Jesus and because it was because he wanted me. I had completely stopped doing drugs and sleeping around and drinking and everything. I had met somebody who I thought was a really good Christian. Um, he had pursued me for a long time and wanted to date me and we had gotten in a relationship, then we had gotten engaged and then just out of nowhere in his house he actually ended up raping me. My initial way of dealing with it was to pretend like it never happened. I didn't know how to be that woman that it happened to a second time. For a little while, I really questioned God because it would have been really easy to go back to drinking and to drugs after being raped a second time by somebody who was supposed to love me. Um, and it had crossed my mind, but immediately I just knew none of those things ever worked. The only thing that ever worked was Jesus. I would pray. I would just say, Jesus, I need you, until the pain went away. And eventually, probably a year or so later, someone pointed out that I wasn't the same. I had realized that he had started healing me, healing my heart. I had a friend at, a time, at the time who was traveling with Eddie James, and they needed a singer. And Eddie had heard a little bit about what I had gone through and wanted to try to help me out. So I went to audition to sing with Eddie James. And I ended up traveling on the road with him for four years. And after he had heard my testimony, he, he had me share my testimony at different churches and conferences and places. I love the way that, that Jesus loves me in, in my weakness. We give him all of our junk, we give him all of our pain, and he gives us joy and peace. When it's all said and done, when everything has happened, it's all done, that was the road, as, as bad as it is, as rough as it is, that was the path that led me ultimately to Jesus, into knowing him, into feeling his love. I just have everything that I thought I never could have. I have a wonderful husband, I have a five-month-old little girl. I lead worship for children. and Some of my best memories in life are, are when I can put my arms around somebody and I was able to pray for them and, and start them on the process of their own healing and restoration and their own walk with Jesus. Those words, I still want you. I mean, it gave me shivers as I watched this story and the brokenness that Carla had experienced in her life. And there she is all alone. And Jesus comes to her literally and whispers those words to her. I still want you. There's a verse that just rang out to me um, that just echoes that back. And it's from Isaiah 38, verse 16 and 17. It simply says this, you restored me to health and you let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. You know, this is the story of salvation for all of us. And maybe today you feel that God has abandoned you, that you are alone in your brokenness. He says to you, I still want you. And I invite you today to to receive Christ as your savior, to say yes to that call of being wanted by God. Will you pray this simple prayer with me? God, I surrender. 
I don't want to die. I want to live. I confess my sin and I turn to you. Come into my life and give me life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to call us. It's a new day. Give us a call right now so that we can pray with you, so that we can walk you through into this new life. We'll be right back. Too often, we carry baggage from our past. You know what it's like. It affects everything and everyone in our lives. It's always there, weighing us down and keeping us from achieving true happiness. But do you know God never meant for us to be trapped in the past? You can be free of your baggage. Learn how God's forgiveness leads to changed lives and new beginnings. Call the 700 Club. Great to have Fatine on the show today. Yeah, you know, she's so knowledgeable about what's happening and uh, just really value her insight. Absolutely. And mm. I, we welcome you to partner with us. And Fatine is on the air as well. Yes. We are proclaiming the good news of Jesus across our That's nation. Right. And it's more important than ever that we know the truth, what's happening in our nation so we can respond properly. Absolutely. Would you be a partner with us? $20 a month or more if you're able. We'll send you this wonderful gift, the I Wills of God. One 855-759-0700. It would be such an encouragement if you'd call now. And would you just link arms with us? We want to pray for our leaders. This is going to be a very important election. It's a watershed moment. I want you not just to hear the prayer, but pray with us, but also connect with your, your friends and also those in your church and those in your community and tell them, Make sure you vote. You know, 1 Timothy 2, 2 says, pray for those in authority. And let's do that right now. Father, we ask you, Lord, over the Peace Tower, it says that, Lord, he shall have dominion from sea to sea. And so we join in agreement with the fathers of confederation. And we believe in this hour, oh God, that you are even now smiling on Canada. And we're asking you that this election, Lord, that you would allow the candidate of your choice to come forward. And we pray that the voice of the church would rise up and echo and it would tilt the balance. Mm -hmm. Lord, do it for your glory. Do it for righteousness sake. And we thank you for our leadership. Leaders, we pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, here's a verse for all of our country. We believe, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to plans to give you a future and a hope. Hey, keep praying that and standing on it until next time. God bless. Take action. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.